Thank you so much, Igor. Thank you, Olaf, for inviting me and Professor Cho to present today of this very exciting uh, initiative that I hope that many of you will be interested in partaking. Uh, my name is Rachel Ray, like Igor mentioned. I'm going to be your chef for the lunch. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, well, can you all see my screen? Okay, perfect. All right. So um, today, I'm hoping to introduce to you the uh, collaborative online international learning opportunity here um, at UT. And this is one of the many ways where we can increase the students global engagement in the university classroom. But before we get started, what I really wanted to do is to ask all the audience a quick question. Why are you interested in learning about the COIL? And before you put anything in the chat, I have a request. So I'm gonna give everybody about one minute to write down a short, succinct answer in the chat. And I'm gonna count to three before all of you will post the answer together. But I will let you know why I'm asking you to do this later on. Um, so are you ready? Okay, all right. Why are you interested in learning about COIL? So in a few sentences, a few words, I'm gonna give you about a one minute to write down the answer in the chat. Um, but don't post anything yet until I count to three. All right, 30 more seconds. Why are you interested in learning about COIL? Okay, are we almost already? If you finish, give me a thumbs up. Okay. All right, on the count to three. One, two, three, post. Whoa, <laughs> I always love this. So I'm gonna read a couple of those. The best teacher I can, improve learning collaboration. Keep an eye out for the opportunity. Yes, thank you, Chris from TLS. Uh, continue to help transform students, lifelong learners, looking for ways to improve student engagement, learning. Uh, and this is relatively new. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Oh, I love this because I know nothing about it. That's the spirit. <laughs> and Josh, exploration of cultures and more accessible. Yes. And technique, creating collaborative environments, engage more, bridge gaps. Oh, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> and Mark, uh, brought an appeal to international students, how OLAP helped intersect where online learning fits. Uh, learn about the methods. Jengen, good to see you. Uh, and Laura, thank you. You love global learning, interest in expanding. And also Adam, want to learn more how to support the Hassan faculty. Uh, thank you all so much. So I will explain later why we did what we did just now. Um, but before we get into the coil, I want to show you a few numbers. So a recent study has found that worldwide outbound physical mobility, which means students study abroad worldwide, um, it's about 2%. And which means that about 98% of the students throughout their years in the university or in the colleges, they would not have the opportunity to have the mobility to study abroad. Uh, and what does the UT number look like? Pre-pandemic, uh, we have about 4.3%. So we're high, we're slightly above the average. Pre-pandemic time, we're sending about 1,500 students to study abroad, and that's about 4.3% pre-pandemic population on campus. And you might be asking, coming out of the pandemic, what do we look like? In the coming year, we have about 1,200 students scheduled to study abroad among the 37,000 students. So we're looking at about 3.2%. Why this number matters? Keep looking. Uh, Sorry, going back. 
Another number I want to share is a recent Gallup survey in June of 2022 found that eight out of 10 people are working hybrid or remote, which means that only 20% of them are fully on site. Also, another study by AT&T found that hybrid work model is expected to grow from 42% in 2021 to 81% in 2024. So 81% of the people in the workforce are expected to have some kind of a hybrid work experience. Again, why these numbers matter? I'll keep you in suspense and let's look at what COIL is. COIL stands for Collaborative Online International Learning. And the term combines the four essential dimensions of real virtual mobility. It is a collaborative exercise of teachers and students. It makes use of online technology and interaction. It has potential of international dimension. I say potential, because sometimes when you see COIL, the I could also stand for intercultural. So it doesn't always have to happen across the sea, across the borders. Sometimes it could happen in United States between university, colleges, different places. And the learning aspect is COIL is integrated into the learning process. So collaborative online international learning, it is a type of a virtual exchange that brings together the students and faculty members from different countries to work together on the shared learning projects, discussions, or activities. And how does this happen? In a nutshell, um, it's usually an instructor shares a course developed in their culture. And in our case, it will be a faculty member here at UT and you share one of the courses that you have already developed, an existing course. And then you share it with an instructor from another culture who has a course either in the same discipline, different discipline, actually interdisciplinary is happening a lot in the COIL world. And with this shared courses, you will implement some icebreakers during the classrooms. And after that, the students from both classes will work together in teams on collaborative projects over five to eight weeks. And five to eight weeks is a typical COIL, but also we have seen some COIL programs that's much shorter, only one assignment, a couple weeks, or much longer, it could take up the whole semester. It's very flexible, completely up to the faculty members who are collaborating with each other. Now I'm saying that COIL is a type of virtual exchange. So not all virtual exchange are COIL. Now, what are some of the characteristics? What can we call a program a COIL? First, the COIL is a registered service mark marked by the SUNY system. So the word is actually coined more than 20 years ago when the virtual exchange was still something very innovative, not a lot of people know about. And the SUNY system um, started calling it a COIL and service marked it. So during the service mark process, one of the important feature and the character is that you can never charge student participants to participate in the COIL project. So if you wanna use the name, make sure that you can never charge a student for that. And a pro pro COIL project typically involve two or more classes from different countries, each contributing their unique perspectives and expertise on the common learning objective. So for example, students from the US university might collaborate with the students from university in South Korea and create a joint project exploring the history and culture of their respective countries. So that's one. And then the second characteristic is COIL is usually embedded in the existing course. And that's the beauty of COIL, because we all know that how difficult it is to create a new course, have a new code, establish a new thing. But COIL could be as short as a couple of weeks, as long as a semester, embedded in the credit bearing course. So you have the, as faculty members, you have the flexibility to choose whether or not you wanted to incorporate COIL into an existing classroom. And like I mentioned, it's usually five to eight weeks. It could be longer, it could be shorter, it involves two or more classes. But in some cases, we have seen faculty members engaging partners from more than two different places, different countries. As long as it's contributing to your learning objectives, it's absolutely possible. Uh, it just takes a little bit more coordination. 
And then it can be done at any level, from the undergraduate level all the way to the PhD level. It can be done. And we, in some cases, I have also seen COIL courses which match an undergraduate class with a master level class. It really depends on how the two faculty members design the projects. Do the students have the prerequisite knowledge to participate and be effective team members in these assignments and projects? But it can definitely be done even across the different levels of the students. And also, one important aspect of COIL is it has a component of intentionally designed intercultural interactions. Because one of the main COIL objective, learning objective, is intercultural awareness. I know a lot of people say intercultural competency, but don't, we don't expect the students to actually grow competency just after attending one COIL course. What we can do is through the multiple channels, multiple options, COIL being one of them to help the students to develop the intercultural awareness so they can reflect on their experience and the grow the different perspectives. And also finally, it could be in the same discipline or it could be interdisciplinary. So we talk about what COIL is, and it's important to also talk about what COIL is not. First, COIL is not a substitute for study abroad. So it's not a stepping down if you cannot afford to go study abroad, and this is the, the second to the best thing. It's not, because COIL is a completely different experience for all the students. It is intentionally designed to be a virtual exchange experience. And in fact, a study was done by the Cultural Intelligence Center that has shown that students who participated in COIL actually grow more intercultural awareness than those who study abroad, but without the COIL component. And the reason is that the intercultural learning piece was intentionally designing the COIL course, course, while study abroad might not necessarily be the case. But does that mean that it has no whatsoever correlation between study abroad and COIL? Actually, no. Because again, the study was done to show that COIL, although not intentionally designed to encourage a study abroad, the enrollment was not targeted at any, at any groups, but the students participating has shown overall 77% point increase in the probability of subsequently studying abroad. And also what's so significant about that data is that it includes the significant increase amount of first generation, how eligible, African-American Hispanic students. So COIL is really an inclusive teaching tool and also opening the doors for a lot of the students who otherwise would not have this global engagement opportunity. So that's COIL. And then secondly, it's not co-teaching. So co-teaching is faculty members come together, co-design a curriculum, deliver the course together to both classes of the students. It's not co-teaching at all, because although there might be some common lectures, faculty have full control over the contents that they are teaching their own students and control the learning outcomes of their own students. Also, the students are only graded by their own faculty. So in that sense, you don't have control over the other class, the other faculty member don't have the control over your class. You are co-designing a project assignment, but you are not interacting or impacting the other's class in the way that in the capacity of teaching the other students. And the third is not focused on language learning. And some people might say, wait, COIL, international, why it has nothing to do with language? It's not that it has nothing to do with the language, but language a lot of times here is considered to be a tool. So it's a means to the end, but it's never a learning objective in the COIL course. But we do have to consider the language fluency of teachers and students in each cohort, but it's never focused on language learning. I will give you a quick example of that. Um, a lot of times the COIL we have seen happening between United States and another culture, another country, a lot of times we're using the language English, which is a dominant language. But then during the classroom design, you might have to be very intentional about designing some assignments to allow the students English, whose English is not their first language more time to reflect on the assignment and work on the assignment. So you can see some of the asynchronous assignments given to the students where 
uh, they might be able to use some Google Translate uh, doing the Grammarly or hopefully not chat GPI, uh, GPT that, you know, to coin the whole thing, but they're going to have some of these language enabling tools to make them more confident in contributing to the teamwork. And that's another reason that we did the question at the very beginning. It's a very common tool that a lot of COIL professors will be using in the classroom in such a setting that instead of asking all the students to post in the answers in the chat as long as they have it ready, we will give the students a period of time where they can um, put down their answers, edit their answers, and then on the count of three, post the answers all together. So that took the uncomfort or the, um, um, the, the pressure of the students whose first language is not the language that's using the classroom to be having this pressure that I have to post something immediately. And a lot of times that will actually hinder the students from participating in the classroom. So that's why when we did the first question, why are you interested in learning about COIL? I asked everybody to coin the question, uh, coin the answers, put down the answers, but do not hit the sense. Let's send at the same time. So it's leveling the playing field for all the students in the classroom. And then finally, it's not an online course. Uh, I know that OLAF uh, staff and the colleagues are not happy to hear why it's not an online course, but it has an important online component of it. A lot of COIL courses and actually happen in their home country as an in-person course, but the COIL components is utilizing an online technology platform. So that's the difference. I will show you a quick picture of a COIL course that we did last semester with the Architecture Studio Design course. As you can see, all the students here at UT, they're attending in person. And this is one of the midterm interaction they had as a whole class interacting with the COIL participants from Seoul National University. Again, all the students in the classroom at UT are taking this course in person, but the COIL components, when they're having this group discussions, group work, it's happening on the virtual platform. So besides a actual like Zoom setting, WebEx that we're using for the, for the, for the teaching, we also encourage students to also choose the tools that they wanted to use to communicate with each other during the group work. So now I wanted to show you a typical eight week COIL program, how it's set up. Now, remember that it's very flexible. It's just a one of the examples. If you're doing an eight week, this is the typical course design. For the first week and the second week, Usually we will have some icebreaker activities incorporated in the classroom to make sure the students are familiarized with each other. And a lot of times we encourage these icebreaker activities to be far from what the course content is. So if you're teaching studio course, studio design, how about talk about the favorite music, the food, you know, I'm, I'm always a huge fan of talking about the food. I think everybody loves food. That's like across the world. Um, and then after the icebreaker activities, of course, we will introduce the platforms we'll be using for this core component to the students. And again, also encourage the students in their smaller groups, explore some of the social media um, tools that they can use to communicate each other for the effective team teamwork. And then for the next week, it's the engagement period. Coil course, when you have the project assignments, it's you usually divide the classrooms into the smaller groups. And later on, Professor Cho will talk about, in her case, how the teams are formed. But typically, you have smaller teams. So about two students from each institution form a group of four, or no more than six. So smaller, the smaller teams are, the better the experience for the students. So I wouldn't encourage you have 10 people group. And here during this week, the instructors or the professors will also use some tools to facilitate the discussion, the comparison analysis exercise inside the group to make sure that each group can function. And then for the next two to three weeks, that's the assignment time, group work time, teamwork time to together work on the project or solve a problem. And then during the final one to two weeks, the student will come together, co-present, 
the outcome of the project. Again, the project could be, you know, uh, an artifact, a design, a presentation, discussion, research. So it's any kind of format that you can think about. And another important step is self-reflection. So for the intercultural awareness learning, sometimes you don't actually feel that you are learning unless you stop and reflect on the experience that you just worked on. It's very interesting that uh, one of the recent courses we did, we assessed the students. A lot of students were frustrated throughout the teamwork. And that's a collaboration between the UT students and then students from Seoul National University, uh, which is Asian culture. So the students put in the comment, we thought that we did everything we could to communicate with our team members to let them know that this is what we're gonna do, this is what they're gonna do. And everybody agreed, but they came back the next day, the results were different. So this is the type of the frustration we wanted the students to be reflecting on was like, why did the communication not reach the effect that I used all that it's gonna reach? So that's the sum of the important pieces during the final one to two weeks. Instructors will help the students to understand um, their experience and make sense of their experience. And of course, we have the course assessments, which will be facilitated by our CODO office. And I'll skip the uh, couple of the CODO examples because Professor Cho will talk about her class. And I will briefly touch upon the CODO benefits. I'm not going to read the whole slides. There's too many benefits to mention. So I will just highlight a few. So for faculty members who are participating in CODO, it is a tool to actively engage the students in the classroom learning. It is a pedagogical or andragogical development. Um, so it's a professional development for faculty members. How could you engage the students more and how could COIL benefit the learning outcomes? So COIL is not for every class, but there are some classes could be largely enhanced. The student experience and also the learning outcomes could be enhanced by having this COIL module. So just think about that, how, what are some of the classes might benefit from COIL? And then secondly, for faculty members, COIL helps to establish the connection for potential research or other collab academic collaborations. If you're interested in working with some faculty members overseas or working with some institutions, we will be able to help you to identify international partners. And maybe COIL is the first thing we do together to explore each other's academic uh, programs and then later on lead to research collaborations. And for students, First, um, I cannot stress enough, increased intercultural awareness. So there are a couple of the studies that one was done in 2007 by the Cultural Intelligence Center, and another one was just recently published on January 25th uh, in one of the journals for the virtual exchange, showing significant increase of students in intercultural intelligence after participating in this course. And the students, the samples is um, a sample size is usually around 100 students, and there are more increased um, points reported among US students than other countries. And then secondly, it's about gaining experience in virtual teamwork. So as you can see, some of the numbers that I shared at the very beginning, that virtual teamwork has become an integral part when students are getting on the job market. So nowadays, if we're expecting 81% of people having some kind of a remote or hybrid working expectations in their class, in their workplace. What are the employers going to ask for? Some virtual teamwork experience when they are still in school. So COIL is a perfect tool for us to give the students these experience. And again, going back to what we're talking about, the Digital literacy, does having the tool to know how to use email, video gaming, uh, video conferencing, does having experiencing all of those equal to a virtual teamwork experience? I would argue that not necessarily. Because a lot of things, until you work on the project together, you don't know how to correctly imply, uh, apply all of these learning and virtual tools during the teamwork, how to be effective in the teamwork. So we are collaborating with the, with the Career Center to see how can we translate that what the students have learned in the COIL courses onto their 
diploma onto their resume to showcase to the employer the employability of the student by having this component. So these are some of the very important benefits that bring to the students. And finally, we have already touched upon that core is really a way to open the doors for all the students, provide this equality in the classroom, making sure that the students, doesn't matter economic, social status, they all have this opportunity to have this global learning experience in the, in the classroom. Since we're talking about money, COIL is a revenue neutral model. Like I mentioned that COIL is taking an existing class. So the pre-assumption is that all the students in the classroom are already enrolled, charged the tuition, and also awarded grades from their home institution. So that's taking the money out of the equation, which makes the things much easier on the administrative side to uh, implement COIL in the classroom. But does that mean that COIL comes free? Not necessarily. Uh, I would love to show you a graphic here. It's the COIL bridge and it's uh, conceived and also made by uh, a mentor of mine, John Rubin, who is a, uh, the person who started the COIL, SUNY Cent COIL Center. And he made this graphic to show that to help the students across the COIL bridge, there are some important pylons. So we have faculty members, you are the faculty members, professors, you're devoting your time to learn about COIL, to develop the courses, implement the courses. And we have the technology side. So our wonderful colleagues from OLAB, from OIT, from TLI will be helping the faculty members to take the COIL into the classroom. And then we also have international programs, which is where I'm sitting, the Center for Global Engagement. We are normally responsible for identifying, coordinating the COIL courses with international partners and also helping the faculty members to look at the intercultural competency, intercultural awareness part of this COIL module. So there are a lot of members, a lot of uh, human resources involved in taking the COIL and implementing the COIL into a classroom. So although the COIL seems to be free for the students, it actually costs a lot of staff time in the process. And also, as you can see, in the sea of monsters, the biggest one is the crab. Faculty and staff overloads. We all experienced that throughout the pandemic time. We're doing a lot of online things, um, taking a lot of additional steps to ensure that our students have a good experience. So how do we deal with that? Um, I'm showing you a supporting structure here at UT. What are some of the moving parts? We are making, we are trying to make the COIL initiative a successful one here at UT by collaborating with all of these important partners on campus. So I would do it clockwise. Um, first, the OLAP, thank you for us to give us this opportunity to talk to all the faculty members about this COIL initiative. Um, so I have also been talking with Josh about and, and Igor about how do we implement COIL? How do we provide um, this opportunity to some faculty members who might be interested in it but also their bandwidth is limited and how do we make sure that we provide enough support um, and the instruction, wonderful instructional design team here. I know that uh, Professor Cho worked with Tonya um, on some of the instructional design. So thank you so much for providing that support. And the student success team that we have been talking with them about, uh, you know, what about the first year studies program? Would that be a good opportunity to introduce global learning to the students during their first year? Maybe give them a taste of COIL. And that's a possibility. And another more important part is that about the course assessment. How does COIL components contribute to retention and graduation of the students? So there are some studies already showing that, but as a pioneer in the field, UT really wanted to contribute to the empirical study of COIL's impact. So we're working with the student success team on that. Um, and the Center for Global Engagement, like I mentioned, we're responsible for identifying international partners, helping with the intercultural competency part of the design, career development, how do we translate what students learn in the COIL classroom into their employability. Provost Office, um, we're very fortunate that Provost Office funded one full-time COIL coordinator position in my office and also given us some budgets to take COIL into the next level. Um, and also teaching learning innovation, uh, our wonderful colleagues over there 
will collaborate will collaborate together to see how we can develop some in-house training for our faculty member. So far for the pilot programs, the training has been outsourced. We have a lot of great resources on the market like SUNY, FIU, uh, and Professor Cho will talk about you know, Central Unison. Um, and all of these are great, but at the same time, it's not customized to UT faculty. So it is our vision and hope that we can develop some in-house training in the next couple of years to hopefully whoever's interested will be able to offer that continuously. And also OIT is providing the technical support for a lot of these technologies that are happening. And also outside of UT, we have a much bigger community. Um, and we're very fortunate to have John Rubin who started all to work with us as a consultant. Some of you have met John already, and we're hoping that in the future to invite John to talk to the larger audience. And also there's a global community of practice for COIL program. So once faculty join, you will be connected with colleagues all over the world who are interested in COIL and many others. And what's most important, the partner, the centerpiece is the faculty at UT. So you are the most important piece of making COIL work. Um, and we are in the process also forming a community of practice. So later on, I will give you a link how you can participate if you're interested in learning more. It's not a commitment right now, so but we do want you to feel comfortable of coming to future events to talk about COIL. And as I talk about future other resources. We have the COIL Connect website. As you can see that these are the universities right now actively looking for partners. And you can actually see all of the courses they're offering if you're interested in that UT is a member. So we can help you to sort through these possible collaborations to identify the, uh, the right one. And also there are many other established COIL centers that we have been learning a lot from our aspirational COIL centers. So these are just some of the examples of that. Um, and we have a lot of funding opportunities. One of the uh, um, virtual exchange funding opportunity is that established by the US government is the Stevens Initiative. It actually gives a lot of funding for virtual exchange that happening across the United States. Also our own UT Global Research Office, we have a Global Catalyst grants that we give some seed grants for faculty to do innovative research and teaching. Um, and we are constantly monitoring other grant announcements that has this virtual component in it. One of the recent one is a uh, US-Japan collaboration grant opportunity that we can actually offer COIL through that. So we will reach out to the faculty members utilizing the network that we established to send out these grant opportunities. And our, you can treat our office as kind of like a central information hub and we can connect you with all these different opportunities. And finally, the COIL uh, initiative uh, through the provost office funding and support will be able to give out some seed grants to help award or um, establishing some COIL fellows and also some uh, COIL pilot programs, as well as in the future, some COIL rewards, awards. Yeah, so I've spent enough time talking about the general things about COIL, and I now wanted to hand it over to Professor Cho to talk about specific case. <clears throat> Can you see the, um, the slides? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, I'm so sorry that I'm really uh, suffer from the allergy. <laughs> so please bear with me like a with very weird voice and a cough uh, occasionally. Uh, I am uh, Muni Cho, an associate professor uh, in the School of uh, Tambra School of Advertising and Populations. I'm so honored to share the um, some of the examples or like uh, the opportunity that I have uh, with the my class last year, uh, and then as like many of you, oh, I had like a really no chance to, I mean, no idea what coil is until last year when Rachel introduced. I was like, okay, this is great opportunity, but I had to start from scratch. But um, yeah, this class uh, I chose this uh, the public relations case class. Uh, the main purpose of the class is to 
kind of fast like a learning uh, of the uh, like strategic communication, especially in the uh, from the public relations perspectives. So we cover lots of the topics uh, related to the um, you know like public relations uh, from the corporates and nonprofit organization with the different topics like uh, sustainability, communication, etc. So I thought like uh, this is great opportunity, and then yeah, many of our students once graduated, uh, they will. Uh, work as a PR professionals and working with the many global companies and in publics from the different cultures. So I thought like this is great opportunities. And then unfortunately, not many of my students have experience with the uh, the study abroad or even travel with other countries. And then because we are suffering from the you know, pandemic uh, at the time. So yeah, it was a really um, kind of yeah, worth uh, opportunities. Um, so last year I uh, applied for the Central Asia University Partnership Grants programs to get the like four weeks training about COIL. Uh, this is funded by the Embassy of the United States of the America in Tashkent. And it is administered by the American Council for the International Education. So, um, they actually hire the the one of the coil uh, the facilitators um, who used to be uh, in the SUNY systems. Uh, so she was our moderators to how to facilitate the learning opportunity uh, with the uh, the chosen uh, twenty faculty members. So we had a, a total of ten uh, faculty members uh, from the United States and ten from the Central Asia to get to partner each other. And then we are um, encouraged to design uh, some of the multidisciplinary courses, uh, activities across the subject area that jointly address United Nations uh, Sustainability uh, Development Goals, uh, UN SDGs. So this class, my class, um, mainly for the undergraduate students uh, with the juniors and senior students. And this course was matched with the uh, Dr. Dina Mem. Member, yeah, member Bivar's uh, graduate course, like a master's students from the Nucus State's uh, pedagogical institutions. So all of the students are the, the master level uh, learning about the linguistic uh, issues uh, and then some of the like uh, learning English as a second languages uh, in Uzbekistan. And we are um, decided to choose the uh, address about the SDG, the, uh, number 13, climate actions. So um, we actually, I mean, it was a little bit, uh, we have a lot of challenges because we are yeah, both are new to the COIL. And then um, we, I mean, the training was uh, started like early January till um, like uh, early February. That means we had no chance to learn our core partners until the semester before, uh, before the semester starts. And we had no time to discuss the, what kind of activities we can come up with and what kind of commonalities we have. And then, you know, even though uh, her class uh, mainly talked about lots of the linguistic issues, nothing related to the uh, strategic communications. And it's from the my students, like uh, why we have to connect with the, uh, the students from the linguistic department. So lots of the frustrations uh, was created uh, in the beginning of semester. And it's just, uh, yeah, uh, many of students are really frustrated, like uh, why we have to do this additional work because they thought like this is additional work extra a kind of burden during the coursework. So even some students, once I introduced these kind of the opportunities uh, and a kind of plan in the beginning of the semesters, they had to switch to another section because they really wanted to, yeah, avoid the kind of the unnecessary um, kind of burden during the semester. But uh, so I ended up with the like 18 students uh, participating in this COIL project. And then Dr. Dina's class has a 23 students. So in total, like we have over uh, 40 students working together, uh, learning about the you know, climate action. How can we address these climate actions uh, in you know, the publics in you know, different cultures? So, um, I, I mean, after uh, completing this coil, I have like a, some kind of great opportunity to work with the uh, 
the TLI about the like a scholarship for the learning. So I had a chance to jot down what I learned, what would be like my reflections from these um, the collaborations, and what I can share with my uh, the fellow UT faculty members. So I kind of create like some um, the canvas page. Uh, and then I can kind of show it like a later on with it, like some tours and some of the examples that I have. But these are some, I'm gonna like share some of the like some things that you have to consider uh, before uh, you, you know, implement the coils. Um, so it's always great to identify the goals and purpose and outcomes of the, this virtual engagement, even before you decide to come up with the, like a coil and a partners. So um, yeah, but we yeah in my case it really hardly we have to improvise like what we can do together and then what we can make like our students like really release uh, the burden uh, from the extra like uncertainty. So that was like another kind of additional uh, uh, goals that we came up like a uh, try to make like everything into smoother and then try to be like a little bit low key to understanding different cultures, the how to communicate people from the different cultures and then about these kind of uh, subject matters. Um, and then, yeah, we try to do a lot of the educational piece and the learning kind of cultural uh, pieces as well. Um, and then you have to think about like some of the communication channels um, because our, uh, the partner and their university do not use the canvas. So we decided to use the Google Classroom. Uh, I mean, OIT uh, can help us to um, uh, to provide like, uh, some of the uh, access to the uh, Canvas. There's some kind of fee involved in this kind of process. So, uh, and uh, given the limited time, we decided to go to like uh, the free platforms like uh, Google uh, Classrooms, but we realized lots of the drawback using this kind of free uh, channel because there are lots of way like restrictions to unload the document or like a share the comments like the like a, lots of the engagements was a little bit uh, very like restricted uh, and then we realized that um utk like a uh, our like a uh, oit is, has a really great uh, security system so many of the uh sense uh, emails from the um uzbekistan was blocked even though we exchanged the uh, email in the beginning of the semester, but our students were always complain, oh, we didn't get the emails from the students and the teams. So we had to find, like, we almost take um, more than like three weeks to identify what's the best way to communicate with the, the folks around there. So it's always uh, better to share like private emails or Google emails before the, the collaboration starts and then identify like, whether Zoom is a, uh, comfortable with the, you know, for the team meetings. And then, uh, yeah, we encourage students to use like WhatsApp and then Telegrams because not many people use the, you know, like, I mean, it's so hard to identify the, um, the communication channels, but please be aware that some cultures actually censor the WhatsApps or like a Telegram uh, activities. Uh, so that's another things that we have to be aware of uh, kind of promoting to use the, like uh, some software uh, or like some um, the social media apps. And then our students, when they, um, we encourage to use, um, to share their phone numbers to get the WhatsApp or et cetera. They never thought about like putting the country code to share like when they share the their phone numbers. So that's another kind of aha moments that uh, that our students like living in the like very center like a center of the universe. So but we yeah we learned a lot from this kind of the um, the anecdotes we have, and then be aware uh, yeah you have to play with the like some time differences. So we had uh, almost like eight hours differences uh, without daylight saving. And after daylight saving observed, we have like nine hours differences. And then uh, the, we actually was discouraged to, uh, for our students to engage outside of class time. Uh, so it was really hard to identify the best time that we can engage. So some of the like a Zoom session was like a voluntary because our students couldn't make it, and it's like a like a very like a late night for that their time. 
So um, it's always the to identify, and then maybe you have to be you know, informed your students to get some of the flexibility. Um, and then you have to also mind about some of the holidays. So we had like an Easter, Ramadan, and a lot of the national holidays uh, during the semester. So we had to kind of avoid those kind of time periods uh, during the collaboration. And then in terms of semester schedule, uh, I didn't have like any big issue with the um, the my uh, cohorts, uh, like my partner in Uzbekistan, but for some of the Asian countries, like for example, in Korea, uh, they start their some, uh, spring semester in uh, March, and then they start their fall semester in you know like uh, uh, September. So even though like we have like a sixteen uh, weeks of the semester, maybe you have a you missed like almost like a half of the you know time like semester for the engagement. So that's another things you have to consider. And then yeah, language is really important to. I mean, it's not like a learning English or learning language uh, per se, but you have to identify what's the best way to communicate. So um, in our situation, the main language was English because our student, I mean, our, uh, the partner universities uh, students was like also English, like uh, the linguistic majors. But I heard from the my cohort at COIL, they had uh, like a three language that has to use English, and then Russian and Uzbekistan or the other country, like other third languages. And then the faculty members in there should be function as a, like a translator. Um, so that's another things you have to consider. And then, yeah, in terms of the class size, you have to also think about like, how big it would be, uh, what's the ideal size of the class. And then I had a, um, one uh, faculty members in Korea who is really interested in the COIL process, but uh, in terms of the class size, it was like more like a double or triple size. And many Asian countries had like a bigger class than uh, the US. So that's another thing you have to uh, keep in mind. And then it's always like a spend more times to build the rapport and then kind of keep up with the some of the ideas that you have. I always have like some of like a two weeks like a maybe bi-weekly meeting with the, uh, the my collaborator um, in like a midnight. So we have to kind of keep up like how to kind of give uh, assignments together. How can we make the, you know, like a learning process more meaningful? So uh, these are the, some of the tips that I kind of come up with uh, from the, my own hands-on experience. So um, yeah, these are some of the screenshots that we had a Zoom uh, with these students. And then, yeah, we did like some of the ice breaking kind of activities. Um, and then before we even formed um, the teams. And then, so we had like some like a group project and an individual project and then having more individual level of the engagement. So I can share uh, some of the, my, uh, the course. Um, So um, I created like uh, some Canvas uh, page for uh, to share our fellow UT uh, faculty members who is interested in this uh, uh, COIL um, programs, but uh, it's not published yet, but we are uh, stay tuned with the more updates. So um, yeah, I kind of jot down what, um, what do you have to think about and then what, how I implement COIL and then some of the examples how, you know, I kind of engage or what kind of the engaged activities I have. Um, I think we don't have enough times, but you know, once you have, so like, um, I can kind of share the, some of the, the examples. So yeah, group project, like I said, I kind of like share like instructions and then some of the, my reflection page here for the every page. Um, I think, um, I can finish my um, kind of presentation with the kind of the reflection at the end of the uh, the semester. I asked my students to jot down what they learned uh, 
from this opportunity. And this is from uh, the, one of my students. So she, yeah, she's the one who always used a lot of this jargon and this things, but she tried to be more conscious, like using those kind of languages. And she tried to be more slow down when speak. So that's a kind of like a learning process of like, uh, oh yeah, how to engage with the students. And then some of the students actually mentioned that like they really love this opportunity because, because you know, like they suffered from two years from COVID. So they really have no chance to study abroad or engaging with the people from different culture. So this poll really fulfilled their kind of learning and their uh, learning opportunities. And then this is the uh, the comment from the, the students uh, from the Putney University. So many of their students actually had, it's their first time to learn uh, or communicate with people from the United States. So they really enjoy that kind of learning uh, opportunities. And then even like they touched about, yeah, they learned about the environment issue, climate actions uh, from the newspaper and so many things, but they never thought about from the different perspective. So these are the, some of the tips that, or some of the reflection data we have. Uh, but uh, given the limited time, um, I, yeah, I can stop to my presentation, but I'm happy to share like a more uh, like a, my own experience the after like a, if you yeah, if you have. So Rachel, um, why don't you like yeah. wrap up? Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Igor, can you give me the uh, option to share again? Just one final slide. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Okay. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Uh, hold on, let me bring up the slides. There we go. So share again. Yeah, so the next steps, I know that we have limited time today. So uh, I do have a QR code. If you're interested in uh, learning more about COIL, sign up and then we will add you to the email list. Um, but you are on the email list anyways, because I'm going to ask Igor to send me all the participants <laughs> today. <laughs> so you can opt out if you get tired of the email from me. And then secondly, we are presenting again, uh, me and Professor Cho, and also three other faculty members who have done COIL. And one of them is doing COIL this semester from Tom Brass School of uh, PR Advertising. Um, so we are sharing that again, uh, March the 23rd, and my presentation will be minimum at a time. So this will be more of a discussion roundtable forming smaller breakout rooms to really talk about um, faculty member experience. So that's on uh, March 23rd. First 500 registrants, no registration fee. So that's one for TLI. And also questions, I have my email here, um, Professor Cho email right here, and I will end with a picture. So as, again, from the great John Rubin that I've been working with, my mentor on COIL, this is the map of the world that's upside down. Uh, we usually view the world the way, but it doesn't mean that it's the right way, right? We have the United States in the center when we're viewing that, that's on the top. But if you look at the world upside down where the Africa is in the center on the top, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a different perspective of viewing the world. So that's what we're trying to do and trying to provide this opportunity for different perspective to the students and also to the faculty members. So I hope that you can join us on this journey. And it's very exciting that I think uh, we're gonna establish a COIL office at UT and really having this initiative to the, take this initiative to the next level. Thank you. <laughs>